US program here at Chatham House. Um, and so let me take an American uh, angle at, at this question. Not least because for most of us, we've been watching the events in New York over the last week uh, at UNGA. And if you followed the American media, it is all about US-China. It is all about, the rhetoric is all about bipolarity. Uh, if you followed the American campaigns, presidential campaigns, and you listen to the rhetoric coming from uh, some of the Republican candidates, it's even worse than bipolarity. It's, um, it's China as a threat. Uh, and that's really all that the discussion centers around. That is not so uncommon, and what we write in the report is that the common narrative, not just in the United States, but this is also the common narrative that you'll hear in China, and you'll hear in uh, many other places in the region, is this idea of bipolarity, that it's all about US-China, it's us versus them. Um, and in the US, back to the US, uh, this is only gonna get worse over the next 16 or so months as we really go straight into election season, we've already started. Uh, and if anything, actually, it's, it's probably going to grow. Um, there is a sense for many that actually in the next administration, uh, starting January of 2017, it's going to get worse. That if you have Clinton, she's a little bit more hawkish than is Obama. Uh, and on the Republican side, you only need to look at the rhetoric coming out of uh, Trump and Cruz and uh, Rubio to see that they think not so dissimilarly from that. Um, which, by the way, just as a little footnote, I actually don't think the next administration is going to be more hawkish than the current one, but nevertheless. But what we try and lay out in our report is that actually, despite the rhetoric, despite this bipolarity, the reality is far more nuanced than that. Um, and part of the reason that the reality is far more nuanced than that is because of the capabilities that the countries bring to the table, that the region brings to the table. We have a tendency to say China rising because we look at China's economic growth. Um, but it isn't actually that simple. Yes, China's economic growth is now, official figures uh, talking about 7%, it's probably more like 6.8, 6 and it may be lower depending on how much you believe in official figures. But if you, and yes, China's economy is gonna surpass America's in say the next 20, 30 years, possibly, but certainly not in GDP per capita terms, um, it isn't. Uh, and that tends to forget that Japan has the third largest economy in the world, and India's economy is now, this year, predicted to surpass, in growth terms, China's. And so it's a very kind of straight line attitude to say, well, China rising, so China's gonna be this big power, it's bipolarity. If you look at the military, again, we watch China's increasing military spending, but you can't judge the size of one's spending or the size of one's military as a, as reflective of the power that that military brings to the table. The fact that uh, the uh, interoperability between the American, the Japanese, the Australian, uh, to some extent the Indian militaries have, should also, and certainly the South Korean military, should also be reflected in that. Uh, again, America's military spending far surpasses China's if we want to look at that measure in terms of the capabilities, uh, albeit not the numbers. So again, on military terms, this isn't a bipolar situation. This is very much far more nuanced, particularly given the changes that have taken place in Japan over the last year. We could go on. Demographics, again, the picture there for Japan is not so good, but also for China, they've got a real demographic problem uh, that's, they're beginning, that's beginning to hit them. India has a demographic dividend, demographic dividend uh, for the next 20 years. And in fact, India's population is gonna surpass that of China sometime in about 2030. 2035. Uh, if you look at partnerships, again, far more nuanced than just bipolarity. Uh, the, there's new trilaterals, US, India, Australia, US, India, um, Japan. If you look at natural resources, I could go on, and this report does, so I shan't. But suffice to say, this idea of bipolarity is a vastly uh, uh, sim simplified, sim um, simplified one. This is also reflected in policymaking to some degree. Uh, let's go back to the events in New York or in the United States over the last week or two. Yes, absolutely, uh, the rhetoric's been on China, but we've also had an announcement of a cyber, uh, cyber crime initiative. We've had more announcements on progress together on environmental issues, uh, but also there's been progress with India. 
Uh, Prime Minister Modi has been out in uh, the States. He also, by the by, went to California and had a great meeting with Facebook and Apple, et cetera, et cetera, as well as going to the East Coast. Uh, there was the announcement of a new US-India strategic and commercial dialogue that was inaugurated just last week. Let's look at Japan. Uh, also announced over the last few days, is a U and actually inaugurated, is the US-India Japan dialogue trilateral that has been elevated to a ministerial level. Um, also going on this week in Atlanta is the next round of TPP talks, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So this idea that everything is actually just bipolar, again, reality doesn't play that out. So this is essentially, and this is where I'll close, this is what we talk about in the report. We move away from this idea of bipolarity and we actually talk about instead the world, a much more accurate reflection of, of the world and certainly of the region, of the Asia Pacific region, is one which we call flexinodal. Uh, not a great a, a catchy title I will give you, but nevertheless, and what we're trying to reflect is the idea that there are far more diverse actors many instruments of power, it's not just about economy, it's not just about uh, the military, many varying coalitions, depending on what the issue is, and far more interdependence. And so as we look at the region, we analyze the region, we have to think of it in this flexionodal space. Success in this flexionodal space is not, again, going to be measured by the size of one's military or the size of one's economy, but it is going to be measured by the ability that a state has to use multiple tools to engage with many, many different actors and build partnerships with those, uh, with those actors. States that can be adaptable, states that can be flexible. And it is this that we should be measuring our states on as we look at trying to understand the global power distribution or the regional power distribution, not uh, the more simplistic definitions that most people tend to use. Let me try and amplify what uh, Zenny has been saying in terms of this idea of nuance by taking the case of Japan, if you like, and recent developments as an illustration, I think, of the importance of distinguishing between a kind of rhetorical presentation of foreign policy and some of the more complex relationships that Japan is developing with its neighbors. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the media about the, new, the more assertive foreign policy that Prime Minister Abe has embraced. Talk of the new security doctrine of collective self-defense, suggestion of an inevitable conflict with China, and an attention focused on the public diplomacy of Japan which in its simplistic representation is often portrayed as a clash of values. And we talk about the idea of a clash of values as one of our scenarios in the report. Um, while that's not insignificant in terms of the public diplomacy contest, I think we run the risk of mischaracterizing what Japan is doing in the security space. Some of the recent legislative changes are really much more about continuity, not necessarily the foreign policy of Abe per se, but a whole generation of recent prime ministers who've been arguing that Japan needs to adapt and adopt the more flexible approach that Xenia outlined in her presentation. So we see a new national security strategy, an attempt to build new institutions to develop a more proactive approach to foreign policy. Much of this is really about extending the notion of what it means to defend Japan's national interests in terms not only of territorial defense, but also the lives and resources that Japan depends on in terms of its ability to project power both in the region and globally. And the global dimension, I think, often gets drowned out in terms of the focus on China. It's also important to, to, to emphasize, in a sense, the obvious, as we do in the report, that much as security planners and in, in the defense community in Japan worry about the challenge that China poses militarily, obviously in the South and East China Sea, the economic dimension of this bilateral relationship is critically important. And some of the security issues that Japan is embracing so assertively can be framed less in terms of conventional security, but in terms of foreign economic policy. So think in terms of the relaxation of Japan, Japan's ban on arms exports. Superficially designed to enhance Japan's strategic capabilities, but as much an opportunity for Japan to think in terms of its economic opportunities overseas, particularly in Southeast Asia, and also with the United Kingdom. When people think in terms of the next five or 15 years, one of the big concerns has been the, the, the role that populism plays in shaping the intentions and actions of national governments. And on the one hand, if you look at popular opinion in China and Japan, the sort of bipolar narrative seems to drive the bilateral relationship in opposing directions. Growing discontent, growing fear, if anything, in Japan towards China, multiplied by the impact of social media in China, which is arguably making it increasingly difficult for national leaders to balance their interests with their immediate neighbors. 
The good news is, when you look at the recent debate within Japan, for example, over the national security legislation, what we've seen is, in fact, a public that is increasingly wary of being drawn into conflict. So a more nuanced approach, a more nuanced dimension to the political argument. And if anything, I would argue, we suggest this in the report, that the direction of travel that the Abe administration is embracing when it comes to this new, new security legislation is much less about the China threat per se, and really more about issues of national identity, which plays to the larger discussion of values. But national identity defined in terms of constitutional change and issues that really don't have much purchase in the foreign policy space. So if we take a that more nuanced approach, should we be positive or, or negative about trends in the immediate future? I think there's a lot of evidence, if you look at recent developments, to be quite uh, optimistic. We've seen a, a reassertion, for example, of opportunities for trilateral cooperation between South Korea, China, and Japan. Um, while Japan remains concerned about China's growing economic clout, there is, I think, pragmatically within Japan a recognition that Japan will ultimately have to join AIIB. And on critical diplomatic issues, China is seen less as, as a competitor and more as a critical fulcrum, in the words of Susan Rice, for resolving some of the most immediate regional tensions, most obviously the threat posed by North Korea. It's illustrative, I think, of our point in the report that this more flexible approach is going to be dominant in the next few years to consider the way in which she and, and Obama in their recent summit talked about the challenge of North Korea, with the Chinese leader highlighting, for example, his continuing opposition to, to a nuclear Korean peninsula, his critical opposition to any prospective satellite launch in October, the willingness to use sanctions against North Korea. Here we see China playing a role that is very constructive and in a way that meets the aspirations of other key partners within the region. A state which, of course, takes a critical interest in this new, more constructive role on the part of China is, of course, South Korea. And South Korea, of course, is illustrative of this new, more diffuse distribution of power. As a middle power that takes its own national identity in that role very, very seriously, we've seen a much more assertive approach on the part of President Park, both in terms of shoring up deterrence, but in terms of strengthening her ability to cooperate with her allies, particularly with the United States, and to reach out to China in this more constructive uh, role. Now, the problem for states that want to be more proactive in this way and want to be no more nuanced is arguably the lack of effective institutions in order to develop this more um, nuanced approach. The six-party talks is effectively moribund. Uh, the tri me trilateral mechanism, if it starts again in November, may offer some prospect of progress, but the problem in this context is that the North Koreans don't really want to play ball. They don't want, want to engage with these uh, mechanisms. And it's quite striking that Park, in her statement to the UN Security Council, talked explicitly about what she refers to as the Asian paradox, the inability, in a sense, to marry economic integration with closer political and security cooperation. This le then leads into the bigger question, which states are best placed, in a sense, to have that more adaptive, flexible approach? South Korea, as I say, as a middle power, is in some ways well-placed to, to take that role. It's talk, uh, talked of developing new regional institutional mechanisms, such as NAPSI. Um, its own role in hosting the three-power secretariat in Seoul arguably gives, its, gives it diplomatic space to play that role. Uh, its willingness to cooperate with China and peacekeeping initiatives, for example, in the Gulf of Aden. All of these are encouraging developments, but absent a closer relationship with Japan, there are real limits for its ability to play that role. Australia, under its new leadership, may adopt a more nuanced approach for dealing with China, one that may match the interests of the South Koreans. And in Southeast Asia, although the role of Japan has been welcome in terms of its more flexible approach to security policy, we see a division of opinion between states such as Vietnam and the Philippines, which welcome this approach, and Thailand and Myanmar, which may be more skeptical for their own obvious reasons given their proximity to China. So the environment is uncertain, but we see, if you look at these recent events, Illustrations, I think, of a more nuanced approach that is often obscured by the public headlines and some of the critical press reporting. Having covered uh, China for seven years up until earlier this year, um, I can indeed testify that there's a lot of terribly bad reporting and there's been a lot of hype, actually not just from the media, but also from academics and analysts um, with notions such as Chimerica, the G2, sort of China versus the rest, these sort of grand sweeping uh, and frankly rather naive in many ways narratives. So what I think is really refreshing about this report, and I hope you'll have a chance to read it in full, is its um, 
it, that it allows us to get away from some of these very simplistic notions, examine the nuances, uh, and look at the details. Um, at the same time, what I also think is very, very valuable about it is that it does acknowledge that state actors themselves uh, may be prone to buying into some of these uh, simplistic ideas. Um, I think it's striking, um, if we look at the last few days really, that it shows us how, um, how inadequate um, notions of uh, sort of a tug of war between the US and China um, are when we come to looking at some of the issues that these countries face. Um, when we look at the US state visit, yes, we've seen a lot of chatter um, from presidential candidates about the future of the relationship and so forth. Um, but actually what's perhaps more significant uh, is the attempts that are being made to address climate change, the fact that China is prepared to make some progress on tackling emissions. These are issues that we know cannot be dealt with uh, by either nation and, and cannot be simply dealt with as a sort of a competition. It will require cooperation. Um, similarly, if you look at what the way that jitters over the Chinese economy have really reverberated around the world, uh, it shows us how inadequate it is to simply think of China's rise and fall as allowing us to sort of judge how well the US and other countries are doing. Um, having said all of that, what's very clear is that so often these countries um, are incapable simply of cooperating for the greater good because of their own very understandable national interests. You talk about North Korea, and I think that is a very, very good example of a case where really everybody recognizes and acknowledges the problem. Um, at the same time, China's perspective, I think, is very much that while it has an ability, it has a certain leverage uh, over North Korea, it, it really has a hammer rather than a dial. In other words, it can cut off North Korea, it can see it collapse, nobody really wants to see it happen. And more importantly, it really doesn't see why, in its view, it should do the US's dirty work. So while they clearly have a common interest in a stable, uh, non-nuclear North Korea, uh, there are really very profound differences in their views on how you might tackle that problem and on even who should tackle that problem. I think additionally that while um, notions of the G2 are sort of thankfully starting to die away, it's striking that we're entering an era of strong leadership more generally, strong leadership across the region. If you look at Modi in India, if you look at Abe in Japan, and of course if you look at Xi in China, these are leaders that have this very striking sense of trying to build a national narrative of strength and wealth and pride, uh, which may not necessarily be aggressive, um, but it's certainly a lot more assertive than we've perhaps seen from those countries before. And I think as the report sort of makes clear, what the state players believe will skewer the game. So regardless of the underlying need for cooperation of the common interests and values um, and the complex ways in which those interplay, the very profound sense uh, among many people in China certainly that this is a zero-sum game to some extent, that China's rise means an ebbing away of US power um, profoundly influences these things. If you look, for example, at the US response to the uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Now, China's perspective on this is, you haven't allowed us to have more of a say at the IMF and the World Bank. You know, this is our chance, fine, we'll do our own thing. And yet, when we set up this institution, you complain about that too, you seek to block it. Um, and the US, in many ways, frankly, looked rather petty in its response, I think, to the AIIB. While there are undoubtedly, undoubtedly many questions that can be raised about China's approach to the AIIB, about accountability and so forth, um, there's also a, a clear sense that the US was concerned as much about the fact of the AIIB as its nature. What I think um, lies behind this clash is really a sort of a deeper uh, 
sense, it's not just about the immediate competing interests, but it's about the underlying structures. Now, that reflects partly China's history, its narrative of a uh, hundred years of national humiliation. In other words, not only its experience of the Opium Wars and of the brutal Japanese occupation, uh, but also the way in which the party state has shaped that story to add to its legitimacy. Um, but also a rather sort of crudely Marxist education, which many, uh, many people have, uh, have deeply imbued within them, which really gives them this sense that um, anything that is discussed, uh, any course that is laid out, the narratives that emerge within a country um, are fundamentally the results of certain basic in interests that any debate among scholars or within the media is really all grist uh, to the state's mill. And I think that is profoundly sort of written into Chinese understandings of the world. It's worth saying as well that there's a great deal of opus simplification on the other side. And if you look at these narratives of the Chinese dragon stretching out its claws that we see, not just in the Daily Mail, um, but also even uh, among scholars and among academics, then I think we sort of see some of the problems that are there. So I would love to see a virtuous and not a vicious circle with people developing a greater understanding of each other, reaching out to uh, address these increasingly complex problems that they all face. But I think that's going to be incredibly hard to do. I think the lack of effective institutions in the region, which is a very good point you raised, is not just a coincidence. It's not that nobody's got around to building them. Um, it reflects that the problems that have emerged so clearly with institutions like ASEAN, that the countries simply are unable to cooperate uh, to see the longer game, because they're all sort of caught in this prisoner's dilemma. They think, do we trade our short-term interests now for this hope, this distant, rosy view of a uh, wonderful Asian sphere in which everybody's cooperating and operating together much more, um, much more amiably? I think that is going to be difficult because, as I said, this is an era of very uh, strong assertive leadership. Um, it's striking that those leaders have emerged in very different systems, in the world's greatest democracy on the one hand, in its biggest authoritarian success story on the other hand. And perhaps that speaks to a certain appetite, whether it be among elites or among the public, for slightly simpler answers and for a snappier response to the dilemmas that lie ahead. <laughs>